Now that you understand how to play this game solo, in this video I'm going to teach you the rest of the fundamentals in four sections. First is the rules for multiplayer. I'm going to summarize the differences between solo and multiplayer, and then I'll actually play one full sample round so you can see all those rules in action. But I am also going to show you some other really cool things in that playthrough, so you don't want to miss that. And next I'll cover the rules for building a deck, and then we'll finally get to talk about the cards themselves. This is where most of the complexity comes from and how all the cards interact with each other, so definitely don't miss that one. And then lastly, we'll cover several optional rules that change how you play the game, like easy mode, how to keep score, and then my personal favorite way to play the game, campaign mode. So let's begin. There are six differences when playing this game multiplayer instead of solo. The first is staging. You always draw one encounter card per player during the staging step. So that's one card in a solo game, but in a four player game, that's four cards you're drawing. Cooperation. Now, many card abilities can be played to help yourself or your teammates. So a card like Unexpected Courage just says attached to a hero. That could be any hero at the table. You can also play Feint to cancel an enemy attack made on any player or use Berivore's ability to choose any player to draw two cards. So this game was really designed with cooperation in mind, which makes it really fun to build multiple decks that synergize and complement each other and can cover each other's weaknesses. But one rule to keep in mind is that whenever cards get discarded, they always go back to the original owner's discard pile. So like if I play one of my attachments on my friend's hero, if that attachment ever gets discarded, it goes back to my discard pile. The ranged and sentinel keywords let you assist your teammates in the combat phase, letting you attack or defend enemies engaged with other players. I'll show you exactly how this works in the sample round right after this. The first player token. Now the biggest difference with playing multiplayer is that most phases in the round are done in turn order starting with the first player and then going clockwise around the table from there. So during setup, the players choose who starts with this first player token and that player is going to be the first person to play cards in the planning phase, commit characters in the questing phase, engage enemies in the engagement phase, and defend and attack their engaged enemies in the combat phase. And then finally, at the end of the round, during the refresh phase, they pass that first player token onto the next player in clockwise order. So I'll show you all of this in a sample round right after this, but there's one more thing I do need to mention here. And that is that the first player also gets the final say on a few things. They decide which location to travel to in the travel phase, the order in which simultaneous effects resolve, and if the encounter deck lets you choose a target for an effect, that first player gets the final say on who the target should be. So this is a cooperative game, okay? There's always going to be lots of discussion around the table about what to do in these situations, but the fact that the first player gets the final say will keep the game moving along at a good pace and keep your group from hopefully not getting locked in analysis paralysis. Action windows. Now, we already talked a bit about actions in the last video, but for multiplayer games, there are a few additional rules to help resolve any potential timing conflicts that could come up between players. Basically, the way it works is that when an action window opens up, any player can play any number of actions they want in any order as long as all the players agree. Okay, but if there's a disagreement, like one player wants to play an action before someone else, then you can follow these rules here on the screen about who gets to play their actions first. I've honestly never had to use these rules because my friends and I have always just agreed. But again, it's here to just resolve any potential timing conflicts. Player elimination. So in a multiplayer game, there is player elimination, meaning if one player gets eliminated by having all their heroes destroyed or their threat reaching 50, then all the other players keep playing to try to win for the group. So if the remaining players win, everyone wins, even those that got eliminated. But if all players get eliminated, that's when everyone loses. So if you get eliminated, there are a few steps to follow here. First, you discard all the cards in your hand and all the cards you control. Second, enemies that were engaged with you return to the staging area, keeping any damage and attachments those enemies have. 
And then third, other players keep playing, but they reveal one fewer card during the staging step. Although, if you do get eliminated during the staging step, then you still finish out the rest of that staging step as normal, and then the following round is when you would reveal one less card during staging. And lastly, if the first player is the one who got eliminated, then you immediately pass that first player token to the next player. Now to teach you the rest of these rules, it's better if I just show you rather than try to talk about it. So we're going to jump into a sample round now, uh, but if you're a solo player, keep watching because I'm still going to show you some fun action window shenanigans you can use in your games as well as some other really fun things you can pull with arranged and sentinel keywords. So here we go. It's Passage Through Mirkwood again, and I've got two multi-sphere decks here. Uh, this deck currently has the first player token. This is me. And there are three enemies in the staging area. And we've already done the resource phase. So now moving into the planning phase, this is taken in turn order where the first player is going to play all of the allies and attachment cards they want to play, and then they pass to the next player in clockwise order, who then plays all the cards that they want to play, and so on and so forth. After you pass playing cards in the planning phase, you can't jump back in and play cards again. You'd have to wait until the next round to play cards again. So, in my hand, I have Steward of Gondor, which just says, attach to a hero. So that could be anyone's hero, so I'm going to pay two leadership resources to play this on one of my friend's heroes so they can get some extra resources. I'm also going to play Gleowine, uh, who costs two lore resources, and he has an ability that lets me choose any player to draw one card. I don't need to draw any cards right now, so I'm done playing cards, so I pass the turn. Player two is now going to use the action ability on Stuart of Gondor to gain some resources, and um, by the way, just as a tip, I like to use uh, colored cubes to mark cards that I've exhausted and maybe some special things. So uh, instead of turning the card, I'm just going to put a black cube on there to gain the resources for Aragorn. And now player two really wants to draw a card if they can. So they ask me if I can use Glarewine's action on them so they can draw a card. I agree. So I exhaust Glarewine and they draw the Silver Load Archer. Now remember that this planing phase has a special action window that behaves different than the rest. The other 17 action windows happen in between steps in the round, but this action window is open during the entire planning phase. So any player can freely use actions in any order before or after anyone plays cards. So even though I've passed on playing cards, I can still use any actions I want. So player two drew the silver load archer and they're going to play that right now using these leadership resources. And that's all they're going to do for now. So now they pass. And now that all players have passed, we move into the quest phase. But before we do, let me just rewind a little bit and run a hypothetical scenario here to show you why turn order matters. Okay, so let's say that player two was the first player this round. Glaywine and Steward have not been played yet, so player two would not be able to draw their Silverload Archer, and so they wouldn't be able to play anything this round, so let's say they pass. Now as the second player, let's say that I play Steward and Glaywine just like I did before, I would still be able to trigger their actions like before to let this player draw a card and let them gain resources, but they now would not be able to play this Silverload Archer because they've already passed on playing cards. So they would have to wait until the following round to play the Silver Load Archer. So this is why turn order can really matter in some situations. Okay, so now let's move on to the quest phase. The first step where we commit characters to the quest is also taken in turn order. I'm gonna commit all of my characters first, simultaneously, then I will pass and player two will commit all of their characters simultaneously. This turn order matters when you have responses like Theodrid at the table that can trigger when you commit characters to the quest. If you remember, Theodrid's ability lets him give a bonus resource to any hero that has committed to the quest. So let's say that I commit both him and Eowyn to the quest. Since player two hasn't had their turn yet to commit characters, I could only give the bonus resources to one of my heroes. But if player two had that first player token and they committed their characters first and I'm the last player, 
Theodrid could give the bonus resource to anybody at the table. So as the first player, and since Theodrid is caught in a web right now, I'm just going to commit Aowen. Player two is going to commit Aragorn and use his ability to ready after he commits to the quest. Um, I'm just going to mark that with a green cube instead to show he is committed to the quest, but he's not exhausted. So now that both players have passed, we move on to the staging step, revealing two cards in a two-player game. We've got... Chieftain Ufthok and a Force Spider. That's 10 total threat strength against my eight total willpower. So that would mean that all players at the table would need to raise their threat level by two for questing unsuccessfully. I definitely don't want to do that. So we're going to use that most valuable action window, the golden action window, to play actions to adjust my willpower. Remember, this happens after the staging, so I get to see everything that gets out there, but I haven't resolved the quest yet, so I can still adjust willpower here. This is the best time to use Eowyn's ability, which lets me discard cards to boost her willpower. So we're each going to discard one card. She gets plus two willpower. That means we are now matched. Ten willpower to ten threat strength, so nothing happens. We get to skip the travel phase now because there's no locations out there, so let's jump right into the engagement phase. And in my opinion, this is the hardest thing to learn going from solo to multiplayer. So here's how this is going to work. In a solo game, you basically just engage all the enemies with an engagement cost less than or equal to your threat level. So like here, player two has 32 threat strength so he would just engage all four of those enemies um, but in a multiplayer game you actually have to take turns making engagement checks back and forth one enemy at a time and you start with the enemies with the highest engagement cost that meet your threat threshold so to make this whole process easier let's first arrange the enemies in order of engagement cost let me actually stick steward under aragorn here to give us a little more room here that's better so now let me show you a couple examples of how this engagement phase could play out. Let's say that neither one of us chooses to optionally engage anything, so we just let the engagement checks happen naturally. Here's how that would look. As the first player, I check my threat level, which is 25, so these two enemies will definitely not engage me because they're higher than 25. But all of these other enemies have the potential to engage me. And out of these potential options, it's the enemy with the highest of those engagement costs that engages me first. So this four spider is going to come to me here. Now the next player makes one engagement check. He's got a 32 threat. So out of these three available options, Ungoliant Spawn is the highest of those. So Ungoliant Spawn engages this player. Back to me again. And out of these two enemies, the Black Forest Bats engages me next. Actually, let me put this guy up here. That's better. And then going back to the other player, Dolgaldor Orcs is the next highest, so that engages player two. And Chief Denuthok just stays up here. No one engages him. So the problem I see with this distribution of enemies is that player two doesn't really have any great defenders right now because Aragorn is damaged. Denethor is the strongest defender right now because he is the protector of Lorien, so he can boost his defense pretty high. So I really want to be the one to engage Ungoliant Spawn. So player two should take the weaker enemies in this case. So now let's just rewind and run a different scenario here to see if we can manipulate this a little bit to get the enemies we want engaged with us. So instead this time, I am going to optionally engage Ungoliant Spawn here. And then player two is going to take the Orc... And now we do regular engagement checks. So as first player, I take the spider, who is the highest engagement cost of the available options. And then the Black Forest Bats is going to engage player two. And again, no one engages Chief to New Thug. That looks a lot better. So now we're going to start the combat phase. But before we do, uh, there are two new rules about shadow cards that I haven't told you yet. First, there is a specific order to dealing shadow cards. And the order does matter. So starting with the first player's enemies, you deal shadow cards in descending order, starting with the highest engagement cost enemy and working your way down to the lowest engagement cost enemy. So in going against spawn, we get it first. He's got 32 engagement cost and then the four spider gets a shadow card. Then you go to the next player in turn order and do the same thing. So the black forest bats gets the first card because he's higher than the Dogledore orcs. The next rule is that if you run out of cards in the encounter deck as you're dealing shadow cards, then you stop dealing shadow cards. Lucky for you, there may actually be some enemies left over without shadow cards. So you never reshuffle the encounter discard pile to make a new encounter deck while you're dealing shadow cards. 
you only reshuffle the encounter deck if it's ever empty during the quest phase. And now to the combat phase. So in a multiplayer game, here's how the combat phase goes. The first player defends against all enemies engaged with them. Then the next player defends against all the enemies engaged with them. After resolving all the enemy attacks, then we do all the player attacks. Starting with the first player again, they get to declare one attack against each enemy engaged with them. And after they've attacked as many enemies as they want and passed, then the next player does the same with their enemies and so on and so forth. So as the first player, I'm going to choose to resolve this guy's attack. First, I'll defend with Denethor and reveal the shadow card. And it's plus one attack for a total of six. So this would normally kill Denethor. But right now, there is another key action window where I can use actions after I reveal shadow cards, but before I resolve the damage, before the attack actually goes through. I've heard this referred to as the silver action window because it's really the second most important action window that all new players need to know about. It's in this window that I'm going to use Protector of Lorien to discard three cards to get plus three defense, and now Denethor takes no damage. And now we'll do the four spiders attack over here, and I don't really have any great defenders left over, so player two is going to kindly offer to use Aragorn, who has the sentinel keyword, to defend for me. This is great. So Aragorn's going to exhaust. Let's reveal the shadow card. Okay, now it says the defending player must choose and discard an attachment they control. All right, this is a little bit confusing here because Aragorn's defending, but I'm engaged with the enemy. So who is the defending player here? The rule is that when a shadow card refers to the defending player or just you, Sentinel defenders do not change who the effect is referring to. These kinds of shadow effects are always referring to the original player who's actually engaged with the enemy. So that means that I need to discard an attachment, so I'm going to discard Protector of Lorien. Remember, I can't discard Caught in a Web because I don't control that attachment, so uh, this card goes away. And we've defended all the enemies engaged with me, so now we're going to move to Player 2's defenses. Let's defend the Orcs with Gloin. So I'm going to exhaust him, let's flip the shadow card. And it's a plus one attack, so that actually would normally kill Gloin here, but I'm going to once again utilize the silver action window to exhaust Daughter of the Nimrodel to heal Gloin's two damage. So now he can actually take the two damage coming from the orcs. So let's get him a couple resources too. And now these Black Forest Bats, they've got a one attack, and these are always tempting to take undefended because... Taking a damage on a hero is not going to be a big deal, but I really don't want to exhaust Legolas here, and I don't want Silver Lord Archer to die. So let's risk taking this undefended. Ah, shoot. Okay, it's a plus three attack, so this actually would kill a hero. I can't afford to take four direct damage. So we're going to do um, something a little tricky here in the silver action window again. I'm actually going to play Sneak Attack Gandalf, to put four direct damage on the Black Forest Bats during the action window. So his attack has not resolved yet, but I'm still going to be able to deal the damage and kill the bats before the attack resolves. So it's a bit tricky here. It's really cool, though, in that if I kill an enemy before the attack resolves, it will stop the attack completely. So I don't have to worry about that four damage going to my heroes anymore. Oh, and that sneak attack cost a resource from Gloin. So now that all the defenses are resolved, it's time for attacks. And as the first player, I can declare one attack against each enemy engaged with me. And then I'm going to pass to the player two, and they'll do the same thing with their engaged enemies. That's straightforward enough, but it actually gets a lot more complicated when you introduce characters with the ranged keyword. So I've got Legolas and the Silverload Archer that both have the ranged keyword. And there are three major rules for ranged characters that I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to declare an attack against Ungoliant Spawn with my two remaining characters here. And after I declare the attack, all other players can join in on this attack with any number of ranged characters they want. So I'm going to exhaust my two archers here. That's a total of eight attack minus two defense is six damage. And now player two is going to use Unexpected Courage on Legolas to ready Legolas. I'm out of ready character, so I pass to the next player, and now player two can declare one attack against each enemy engaged with them. That's, in this case, only the orcs. However, 
If a player only declares ranged attackers, then they can also declare one attack against each enemy engaged with other players at the table. So I'll exhaust Legolas to declare another attack against Ungoliant Spawn, placing another damage on it. This is a bit tricky, so let me reiterate. In a multiplayer game, it is possible to attack the same enemy multiple times using the same range character as long as you have readying abilities. And that's because joining in on an attack is not the same as declaring an attack. Each player can only declare one attack against each enemy, but you can join in on any number of attacks you want. And as a side note, it's not possible to declare an attack without an attacker, because declaring an attack and assigning an attacker are intertwined. So if you really want a ranged character to join in on an attack, the engaged player must declare at least one attacker as well. So let's recap all the major rules that we've learned in this section one so far. First, we covered the differences when playing multiplayer, where you reveal one card per player during the staging step. Many cards can be played to help your teammates, a lot of cooperation in this game. The ranged and sentinel keywords can be used to assist your teammates in combat. You take turns in many phases, starting with the first player, who also get the final say on a few things. And then you need to take turns playing actions if you can't agree on what order to use. And there is player elimination, so the group only loses if everyone gets eliminated. And then in the sample round, we learned a few other things. Shadow cards are dealt in turn order and in descending order of engagement cost. It's very important. And if the encounter deck runs out while you're dealing shadow cards... That's great. You stop dealing shadow cards. You don't reshuffle the encounter deck while you're dealing shadow cards. And killing an enemy in any action window before the attack resolves will stop the attack completely. So it's some fun shenanigans you can pull there. Defending with a sentinel character does not change who the defending player is. So if a shadow card targets the defending player or just you... That's always referring to the player actually engaged with the enemy. So it doesn't matter if your friend defends with a sentinel character. And lastly, joining in on an attack using ranged characters does not count as declaring an attack against that enemy. So thus it's possible to attack the same enemy multiple times by using ranged characters and readying abilities. <laughs> Let's talk about the rules for building your own custom deck, which is really what this game is all about. Rule number one is you can choose up to three heroes from any of the four spheres of influence. It's leadership, spirit, lore, or tactics. Each sphere has different strengths and weaknesses and kind of specializes in different aspects of the game. So you could build a monosphere deck with three heroes from one sphere, uh, which is what we did in the last video, but this is usually only recommended when playing multiplayer because your teammates can then cover those other weaknesses that you're missing. So in solo games, your deck really needs to be well-rounded in all of the aspects of the game in order to win consistently. So most decks are going to be dual sphere or tri-sphere to try to provide more balance and give you more options when you're deck building. Now, funny enough, you are allowed to choose less than three heroes in your deck, but I would Definitely not recommend that unless you have a very large card pool because there are some specific cards that you need to make a two hero deck or even a one hero deck function. Rule number two is that your deck must be a minimum of 50 cards. Now, most players recommend that you ignore this rule if you're only playing with a core set uh, because you just don't have enough cards in your card pool to build really interesting 50 card decks. Uh, but once you start buying expansions, getting up to the 50 card limit is great, but there is actually no upper limit. So you could theoretically have as many cards in your deck as you want, and it might be tempting to go over 50 cards just because you have so many cards you want to use in your deck. But it is strongly recommended that you consider 50 cards the maximum as well. And that's because the more cards you include in your deck, the more watered down it can be, and the harder it becomes to find the really key cards, the really important cards that you need to make your deck function. So it's hard to do, but try to stick within that 50 card limit. And really, you should only be going over that limit if you're playing something that can cycle through your entire deck consistently each game, like a dwarf mining deck or a Noldor Aerostore deck. Um, 
those are the exceptions. So generally speaking, you should try to keep your deck to about 50 cards. Rule number three is that you can only include three copies of any card by title. Okay, so for instance, there are multiple versions of Gandalf in the game. So you can only have up to three total Gandalfs in your deck. Now, each player could have three Gandalfs in each of their decks, uh, but that is the limit. Now, this last one isn't necessarily a rule. It's just something that most new players miss, and that is that you can include any cards from any spheres you want in your deck. They don't strictly have to match the spheres of your heroes. Now, let me explain here. So playing cards normally requires a resource match where, the you know, if you want to play a spirit card, you have to have a spirit hero to pay those resources, right? We talked about that a little bit in the last video. So in a dual sphere deck, let's say I have leadership and lore, I could fill my deck with leadership, lore, and neutral cards, and then I would be able to play all of them normally. But I would also be allowed to include spirit cards if I wanted. I couldn't play them normally without a spirit hero, and I couldn't even play zero-cost spirit cards, okay? Even zero-cost cards require a sphere match. But there are several clever ways to get around this. Okay, one way is to add additional spheres to your heroes. There's cards like Calabrian Stone, which can add the spirit sphere when played on Aragorn. So Aragorn could become both a leadership and a spirit hero, allowing him to pay for those spirit cards. But another way could be to use a card effect that lets me put a card into play. This is different than playing a card normally, okay? When I put a card into play, I ignore all costs and all sphere restrictions. So for instance, I could use Sneak Attack or Stand and Fight to put Bjorn into play, even if I don't have a Tactics Hero. And for more tips on how to build a good deck, I've got a link up here in the corner of the screen to a top 35 tips for new players. You should definitely check that out. Let's talk about all the most common things you'll find on cards. Uh, this would be keywords, abilities, symbols, and text. I'll primarily focus on the core set stuff, but there are a few things I want to mention from the revised expansions to this game. So before we get into the weeds, though, we do need to establish a sort of foundation for how to interpret cards in this game. And there's really two official rules that lay the foundation for how to interpret cards. First is the golden rule, which says if the ability text of a card directly contradicts the rule books, the card takes precedent. So to put it simply, the whole point of a card game like this is that the cards break the rules in some way. So even if the card disagrees with the rule book, you always do what the card says. In fact, knowing that cards break the rules can sort of help you learn the rules, funny enough. So like there's a card called Stand Together, which lets you declare multiple defenders. So if you know that card exists, then you should know that normally you can't do that. Normally you can only declare one defender. So if a card lets you do something, that probably means you can't do that thing normally. The last rule for interpreting cards in this game is called the Grim Rule. And you gotta love the designers for this one. It says if you can't find the answer to a rules question or a timing conflict in the rule books, then you resolve the conflict in a way that you perceive to be the worst possible resolution with regards to actually winning the scenario. This is supposed to be a hard game, so keep it challenging. Okay, now that we have a lens for interpreting cards in this game, let's look at the top 18 things you'll find on cards. Restricted is a keyword that you'll find on some attachments, usually the most powerful ones. The rule is that each character can only have up to two restricted attachments at a time. So Blade of Gondolin is restricted, so you could have up to two of those attached to a single hero, but not three. You could also have a Horn of Gondor and a Blade on a hero, but if you want to play a third restricted attachment on a character, then you'd first have to discard one of these. Unique. Okay, some cards like Steward of Gondor are unique, shown by this little circle symbol next to the title of the card. It means only one of these things exists in Middle-earth. So there can only be one Steward of Gondor in play on the table. You can put up to three copies in your deck, but only one of them can be in play at a time. And if one leaves play or gets destroyed or discarded, then you can play another one from your hand to replace it. And if in the very rare circumstance that a unique version of a character enters play from the encounter deck, like 
Gildor and Glorian, for example, from the Fellowship of the Ring saga, and there's already a copy of that character under a player's control, then that player must discard the version that they control. Because again, you can't have two Gildors going around. Traits. Now, all characters and most attachments have traits that are shown right below the name of the card. Uh, Glorfindel here has three traits, Noble, Noldor, and Warrior. And traits matter because some cards refer to traits in different ways. Traits don't have rules on their own, but like here in this example, for Gondor refers to traits. It's an event that gives a universal attack boost to all characters, but also a defense boost to characters that have the Gondor trait. Now, some cards also give traits to characters, like Steward of Gondor gives the Gondor trait. And lastly, some cards have play restrictions based on traits. So Sword of Numenor says it can only be played on a Dunedain or Gondor hero. So let's play an example really quick. I attach Steward of Gondor to Glorfindel, giving him the Gondor trait. That means I'm now allowed to play Sword of Numenor on Glorfindel because he's now considered a Gondor hero. Then during the combat phase, I could play for Gondor to boost his attack and defense because he's now a Gondor character. Now let's say I defend against an enemy and reveal a shadow card that says I have to discard an attachment I control. And I choose to discard Steward of Gondor. So question. Now that he's lost the Gondor trait, what happens to my Sword of Numenor? And what happens to my defense boost from Four Gondor? Well, it's actually good news for once. Uh, I get to keep both of these things. Play restrictions on attachment cards like this one only are checked at the time the attachment enters play. So as long as he was a Gondor hero when I played the card initially, I don't check for that restriction again. And lasting effects created by player cards like this one are only calculated once at the time the ability is triggered. And if the game state changes, the effect is not recalculated. Now that's a lasting effect on a player card, but lasting effects on encounter cards work a little different, but I'll get back to that later. Responses are optional abilities that can only trigger immediately after the event specified on the card. These are pretty easy to understand because you really just read the card and it tells you exactly when you can play it. But for heroes, allies, and attachments, that is everything except event cards. So heroes, allies, attachments, if there's a response ability on those cards, you can only trigger them if those cards are in play. Not in your hand, not in your discard pile. So for example, Sylvan Tracker has a response that can heal Sylvan characters, but this only works if Sylvan Tracker is in play. Not in your hand, not in the discard pile. Now there are some exceptions to this though, where the card specifically says it will get triggered while the card is not in play. Brock Iron Fist is one example of this. He triggers while he's in your hand. Okay, but the card tells you that. And uh, Arid Lewin Minor, for instance, his response triggers when he's being discarded from your deck. That's Those are exceptions. The response will tell you, so just read the card and do what it says. Actions are also optional abilities, but you can only trigger them during an action window. So whereas responses could potentially happen at any time during the round and can even interrupt certain things from happening, actions can't interrupt. Okay, you have to wait until an action window opens up to use them. Now, there are 18 different action windows in a round, and generally speaking, they open up in between most steps in the round. But even after years of playing this game, I still open up the rules reference to page 20 in my games to verify exactly when I can use certain actions. It's not intuitive. It's hard to learn, so it's just going to take time and repetition to eventually learn where those are. Now, I'm not going to talk about each action window because this is not a strategy guide video, okay? I'm just explaining the rules here. But I've already covered the three most important ones that you need to know about. Okay, that's the special action window during the planning phase the golden action window after staging, and the silver action window after revealing and resolving a shadow card. So if you understand those three, you're off to a really good start. And I will add a link in the description below to the best strategy guide for action windows if you want to learn more about those. There's two last rules that you need to know about actions, though. So while most action abilities begin with the word action, some cards will say things like combat action or quest action. This tells you that it's restricted to one specific phase. So Feint is a combat action that can only be played during the combat phase, and Secret Paths is a quest action, so you guessed it, can only be played during the quest phase. 
And lastly, this might be obvious, but you always need to resolve each action completely before resolving the next action. Okay, finish one before you start another. Forced effects, as the name implies, are not optional. These are mandatory effects that you must resolve each time the condition is met. So these could trigger multiple times. So these are not one and done. If there's a forced effect in play, you have to be aware of it at all times. And so this is where sometimes the mental load of the game can get a little bit heavy if some quests, they just have a bunch of forced effects on the table. So you have to keep track of all these at the same time. Constant abilities, like these ones, are always active. Okay, just like forced effects, these can be pretty tricky to keep track of. In some quests, there's a bunch of them that come out all at once. So just try to keep on top of those when you see them come out. Direct damage. Okay, so when a card tells you to deal damage, that's called direct damage. And it cuts through all defense and goes straight to hit points. Some cards may also say to assign damage among characters. For those effects, you can't assign damage beyond a character's remaining hit points. So for this Biting Wind example, let's say you had five questing characters, and so you have to assign five damage among your questing characters. You wouldn't be able to put all five damage on your wimpy one-hit point guy. You can only put one damage counter on a one-hit point character. Explored. There are lots of card effects that let you place progress tokens on locations while they're still in the staging area. So you don't always have to travel to a location to explore it. If you have these location control effects um, to place enough progress tokens to meet the quest points, then that location is considered explored even if it's in the staging area. So this can let you avoid some nasty travel effects or maybe even benefit from some effects that will trigger when the location gets explored. All of that can happen while it's still in the staging area, unless the card tells you otherwise. Sphere granting. Now, some attachments can give heroes a second resource icon, which we mentioned previously. Some of these are character specific, like Calabrian Stone only works on Aragorn, but it gives him both spheres. So it's sort of like Aragorn's resources become multicolored. And so you can spend them to pay for both spirit and leadership cards. Objective cards. Now, several quests have objective cards like allies who assist you or important artifacts. Quest cards or campaign cards will often tell you what to do with these, like to set them aside or put them into play, but sometimes objective cards are shuffled into the encounter deck as well. So if you ever reveal an objective card from the encounter deck, you simply add it to the staging area like you would normally with an encounter card, but you just follow all of the instructions on the objective card when you see it. Objectives will remain in play unless the game tells you to remove them. Keywords on encounter cards. There are four major keywords you'll find on encounter cards. These are doomed, surge, guarded, and victory. So let's go through each of these real quick. The doomed keyword is simple. It just forces every player in the game to increase their threat level by the number shown. The surge keyword forces you to draw an additional encounter card immediately after resolving the staging of this encounter card. The guarded keyword is a bit more complicated, and it's not very common. You're not going to see it in many quests, but it is heavily featured in the Escape from Dogal Door from the core set, and it has these three objective cards that have the guarded keyword. Whenever an objective card with the guarded keyword is revealed, even during setup, then you reveal the next card from the encounter deck and attach it to that objective card and place them both in the staging area. So this encounter card is guarding this objective. So you have to deal with this encounter card first before you can claim the objective. So how do you do that? Well, if it's an enemy or location that's guarding the objective, it's pretty straightforward. You just defeat the enemy or explore the location as you would normally, and that will free up that objective. But you can pull some shenanigans here. And if you're able to force the enemy or location to leave play through a card effect, then that also will free up the objective. Now, if it's a treachery that is guarding the objective, then it's even simpler. You just resolve the treachery's effects and you discard it as normal, but you could also cancel the treachery with a card like Test of Will to free up that objective card. Now, if in the very rare circumstance that the card you would attach to the guarded objective also has the guarded keyword, then you use the next card of the encounter deck to fulfill the original guarded keyword and then you resolve the guarded keyword on that second card. So after the attached encounter card gets dealt with, 
then the objective becomes unguarded and remains in the staging area until it is claimed by the players. And the objective card itself will always tell you how you can claim it. One final note is that the guarding enemies and locations still do contribute their threat strength while they're in the staging area, just like normal. And the last major keyword you'll find on some encounter cards is the victory keyword. It looks pretty plain in the game's first four cycles, but starting with the Angmar Awakens cycle, they kind of made it look a bit fancier with a border around it. So after the location is explored or the enemy is defeated with a victory keyword, instead of going to the discard pile like normal, it's added to an area of play called the victory display, which is just an area that's off to the side. It's out of play. The main thing this does is that it gets it out of the encounter deck. So you won't have to deal with that card again during this playthrough. But it's also worth this number of victory points if you happen to be keeping score, which I'll talk about later. Okay, now we're going to get into some of the more nuanced language that you're going to find on some of these cards. Revealing an encounter card is not the same as adding it to the staging area or putting it into play or even looking at the card. Okay, these are all different things. Revealing an encounter card is always worse because you resolve everything on the card when you reveal it. That's the when revealed effects, the keywords like doomed, surge, and guarded. All of those happen when the card gets revealed. So let's compare some of these effects here. The first quest card from Journey Along the Anduin instructs you to reveal encounter cards during setup. That's the bad thing. That triggers everything on the card. But the first quest card on Intruders in Chetwood instructs you to add locations to the staging area, which means you get to ignore all of the keywords and the when revealed effects during that setup step. Now, similarly, there are some cards that say, put an enemy into play engaged with you. Since it doesn't explicitly say to reveal the card, it would not trigger any keywords or when revealed effects on that enemy you just put into play. Also, looking at is not the same as revealing a card. So Hennemarth River Song lets you look at the top card of the encounter deck. You don't resolve anything on the card. You're just taking a peek at it. Playing a card is the normal thing you do in the planning phase, where you pay the resource cost, which also requires a sphere match from a hero you control. But putting a card into play ignores the resource cost and the sphere match and restrictions or prohibitions regarding the potential of playing that card. Okay, I already mentioned the two core set cards that can let you do this, Sneak Attack and Stand and Fight. Both amazing cards. So you could use this to put an off-sphere ally into play, but it also works on cards like Knight of the White Tower. This guy has a play restriction that says his resource cost must be paid from a single hero's resource pool. That gets ignored if you put him into play somehow. This distinction is also really important to make for quests like Escape from Dol Guldur, okay? Because quest card 1B says that you can't play more than one ally per round, but you can still put into play as many allies as you want. You will see lots of cards in this game that have abilities that trigger when they enter play or play from your hand. Okay, Minor of the Iron Hill's response triggers after he enters play. It doesn't matter how he entered play. So you could use Sneak Attack to bring him in and his ability would still trigger. But in contrast, Galadriel's response only triggers when you play her from your hand. That's much more specific. So Sneak Attack would not work to trigger Galadriel's ability. If an ability instructs a player to select among multiple effects, an effect that has the potential to change the game state must be selected. Okay, so for example, the Angmar Orc says that you either discard one ally from play, or reveal an encounter card. So if you have no allies in play, then you must reveal the additional encounter card, because you can't choose an effect that can't change the game state. Some cards have effects that trigger when an enemy engages you, like we saw with the forest spider in the last video. So what you need to know is that engaging an enemy, or being engaged by an enemy, is the same thing. So it doesn't matter how this force spider engages you, it's going to trigger its effect no matter what. So it could engage you during engagement checks, or you could choose to engage it during optional engagements, or you could even use a card effect like Son of Arnor to engage the enemy. You can't get around that forced effect, okay? It's always going to trigger as soon as it engages you. There are many cards in this game that describe a sort of cost 
that you need to pay in order to resolve some sort of effect. Okay, and it's always going to be written in a format like this. Pay X cost to resolve Y effect. Okay, that word to is the key there. That is what you need to look out for on card effects because that word to always separates the cost from the effect. So let's take Berivore as a very simple example. Her ability says, action, exhaust Berivore to choose a player. That player draws two cards. So the cost is to exhaust Berivore. The effect is to choose a player to draw two cards. There's three rules that you need to know about costs. If the cost can't be paid, the effect can't happen. Okay, if Berivore is already exhausted, then you can't pay the cost, so you wouldn't be able to use her ability. You can't pay a cost to exhaust a character while exhausting that character for something else. So if you're exhausting Berivore to commit her to the quest, you can't simultaneously trigger her action using that same exhaust. That's like double dipping, okay, trying to pay one cost to trigger two abilities. Each ability has to be treated separately, with costs paid separately. And lastly, the cost can't be paid if the resolution of the effect does not have the potential to change the game state. Okay, this is a little funky, but let me illustrate this with a little more complex of an example. Darren Dingle Warrior and Honor Guard. Okay, Darren Dingle Warrior has an ability that says, Action, deal one damage to Darren Dingle Warrior to give it plus three defense for this attack. There's the cost and the effect you can see. Honor Guard's ability says, Response, Exhaust Honor Guard to cancel one point of damage just dealt to a character. So you can imagine what many players try to do here is a combo, right? You trigger Darren Dingle Warrior's ability to damage him, then cancel that damage with Honor Guard and still get the plus three defense boost, right? Sadly, no. <laughs> this does not work because you have not truly paid the cost for Darren Dingle Warrior's ability since you didn't actually damage him. Canceling that damage with Honor Guard means that the game state did not actually change. So paying the cost of an ability must actually change the game state. That's the rule. Okay, that was a lot of information, but now you should have a pretty good grasp on the 18 most common things that you'll find on cards in this game. And there are so many different kinds of effects that you'll find. There are thousands of cards in this game, so I'm not going to have time to cover everything out there. But I am going to cover a bunch more in the next video, in part three. And now we're going to end this video by talking about the different ways that you can change how you play the game, including my personal favorite way, campaign mode. This is a very difficult game that becomes easier the more cards you have and the more skilled you become at building decks. So if you don't have a large card pool yet, or if the challenge of the game kind of changes from being fun to frustrating, I would strongly encourage you to try out easy mode. This is not a baby mode, and there's absolutely no shame in playing it. It just simply makes the game more fun if you have that limited card pool, or maybe you're playing with fun decks that aren't necessarily optimal. To play easy mode, you simply take out all of the encounter cards that have a gold border around it, and then you add one extra resource to each hero's resource pool during setup. Some folks even like doing something in between, where you just do one of those two things, either taking the resources or taking out the really hard encounter cards. There's also a very popular fan-made variant called Grace of the Valar. I'll post a link to that in the description below, but basically it helps ensure that you don't get stuck on one quest, losing again and again and again. Um, so it kind of ramps up your benefits each time you lose or how quickly you lose. It's really neat, very clever. I would recommend it. And it even offers an alternative way to keep score, uh, which actually, let's talk about that right now. Keeping score in the game is completely optional. It's there if you want to compete with yourself or with your friends, or if you just want to see which decks perform better. You'll find these score sheets in the back of the Learn to Play rulebook, and you can just photocopy these for your own use. The way it works is when you win a scenario, you first add up the three undesirable elements, that's the final threat level of each player, the threat cost of all defeated heroes, and the number of damage tokens on all surviving heroes. Then you subtract any victory points that have been collected, usually from cards that are in the victory display. And then lastly, you add 10 points for each completed round in the game. 
Note that when a player is eliminated, their threat level automatically raises to 50, and all of that player's heroes are defeated. So elimination wrecks your score pretty badly. And of course, with this system, low scores are better. Campaign mode allows you to play a series of quests as one connected campaign. It was previously only available in the Saga expansions, which followed the stories of the novel, but now it's been added to the new revised core set for a three-quest campaign, and the Darker Mirkwood expansion has a two-quest campaign, sort of a mini-campaign, but you can combine these into a five-quest campaign, which is really neat. Plus, each of the cycles that are getting repackaged in the new two-box format they're also getting a brand new campaign mode, and I think it's a fantastic addition. Not only does it make the quest more exciting by adding these rewards and consequences to your decisions, it smooths out the difficulty curve of the game. It kind of uh, gives you some pressure on the easier quests to make them harder, but it also tones down the difficulty of the most difficult quests that were just frustrating before. Now it's really an enjoyable challenge, in my opinion. Especially Escape from Dol Guldur in the core set, that was previously a nearly impossible challenge solo, but now they've rebalanced it in campaign mode to actually be an enjoyable challenge in solo play. So there are three brand new elements introduced with campaign mode. The first is a campaign log to keep track of everything that happens and help you set up future scenarios in that campaign. You can photocopy this from the rulebook or you can just download a copy from the publisher's website. There are campaign cards also that give you additional setup instructions for each quest and resolution instructions for when you beat the quest. And the best part are the new boon and burden cards that can be earned throughout the campaign. These cards provide some weight to what happens and the strategic decisions that you make. So for instance, you might be rewarded with a boon if you overcome a particularly difficult challenge, but if you take shortcuts or play it too safe, you might earn a burden instead. And you keep track of all these boons and burdens you've earned in the campaign log in a list called the campaign pool. When you set up each quest, you add all the boons and burdens in your campaign pool into the appropriate decks. So they might go in the encounter deck or they might go in your player deck. There are six new rules for campaign mode. Let's go through these real quick. You only advance to the next scenario after winning the previous one. So there's no penalty for losing. You just need to replay the quest again. And generally speaking, the goal is to play with the same heroes from start to finish. And if a hero gets destroyed, but you still win the quest and decide not to replay it, then you add that hero to the list of fallen heroes in the campaign log. After that, everyone would receive a plus one starting threat penalty for the rest of the campaign, and then you would choose a new hero to replace the fallen one for the next quest. So there's definitely an incentive to not lose any heroes during your campaign. But if you really want to, you could choose to swap out a hero in between quests by voluntarily taking that plus one threat penalty. However, let's say you're using Leadership Aragorn, you could choose to swap him with Tactics Aragorn without taking the threat penalty. So you can freely swap out heroes with the same name. Now some boons and burdens also have the permanent keyword. This is kind of like it sounds. It's going to be permanently attached to a single character and it can never be removed and it can never transfer to another character. So when you earn a permanent card, you also record the name of the hero who earned it. And during the setup of future scenarios, that card must be attached to that hero. And permanent cards can never be removed by any player card or encounter card effects for any reason. And if that hero gets added to the list of fallen heroes, then you also lose those attached permanent cards from the campaign pool. Now, all of the other boon cards that get added to the player decks are always optional extras, okay? They don't count against your deck's 50-card minimum, so you still need to play with your standard 50-card deck. The boons would just be extras on top of that, and so you can choose to add them in or not. Now, if you're looking for a harder challenge, there is an expert campaign mode where you make damage on heroes persistent. So any damage tokens on heroes will carry over to every future quest in the campaign. But if you want to heal all the damage from one of your heroes after a quest is over, so in between quests, you can choose to take a permanent plus one threat penalty to heal all damage from a single hero. And the last rule for campaign mode is that each campaign is self-contained. So when you finish a campaign, things do not normally carry over into your future campaigns, unless a card specifically tells you to do that. 
So as of the making of this video, there are two campaign cards in the revised core set and in the Dark of Mirkwood expansion that will allow you to carry over certain boons into your next campaign. So I'm not going to spoil what those are, but if you do play this combined five quest Mirkwood Paths campaign, then you can earn the ability to bring up to three specific boons into your next campaign. And that could be the Angmar Awakened campaign, it could be the Saga campaign, or any other campaign that comes out. Now, I am convinced that the designers put this feature in to help new players specifically with the Angmar Awakened campaign because it is notoriously difficult, and these boons really help with that cycle in particular. So my advice is if you're going to attempt the Angmar Awakened campaign with a smaller card pool, or maybe you just want to enjoy the story more and you're not as interested in a ruthless challenge, then you should definitely start by playing the Corset campaign first to earn those boons to take with you into that campaign. I think it's really gonna make a better experience for you. Click here to watch part three when you're ready to learn the more complicated and lesser known rules for the game. You've been watching The Game Locker. Godspeed.